Shalom Chavrim. I'm Stephen ben Danun, and you're watching Danun Institute of Biblical Research. I want to go right into this message today, exposing the leader of the New World Order, uh, the mastermind, we might call him, of the New World Order. In a lot of different uh, evangelical teachers today, such as Perry Stone, they teach that there is a coming Mahdi. They're taking uh, eschatology through the Islamic teachings of the Quran, and they are lifting up uh, uh, an Islamic Mahdi. Uh, it's also been made very popular by uh, uh, many other different evangelists as well, which is kind of different because they have changed from some of the roots that they, they came from, some of the early Protestants in America that had a different opinion of what the Antichrist would be. Now, of course, the word Antichrist, Antichristo, as Chuck Missler points out, is a pseudo-Christ. The word Antichristo in Greek is a pseudo or a one that is similar to Christ in, in the characteristics. He is not against, but like Christ. And so therefore, we have to kind of keep in mind it's a different different ideology altogether. And, and of course, in 1 John, we also know that John speaks about there are many Antichrists in the world already. Uh, and that was back during his time. Uh, he also says that many grievous wolves have entered in among us. Uh, so there again, they're grievous wolves, but they're dressed in sheep's clothing. That's more like your Antichristo, Antichrist. Anyhow, nonetheless, though, in all of the teachers that have taken and have gone on a different limb looking at the Mahdi as being an Antichrist in the future, one thing that they all kind of hold in common, and that is that this leader that will come upon the world uh, in a very near future will lead uh, the world's religions. He will have a one world religion. He will also be a man that will lead a one world government. He is the man that will actually bring about the one world economic change the, because it kind of goes hand in hand. The mark of the beast, the 666, you can't buy or sell saving you take this mark. So the question is, is who is there that has the ability to pull this off? Now, of course, we see that Obama has been called the Antichrist. Before Obama, you had the, the Iranian uh, president, uh, Ahmadinejad, who was called the Antichrist. I remember that was really kind of a joke to me because it's like I kept thinking to myself, do you really think Ahmadinejad is going to bring about a one-world religion? Oh, hello, my goodness. In fact, speaking of that, what about Barack Obama? Do you think Barack Obama could really bring about a one world religion? It's, it's just ludicrous to even consider uh, these different Muslim leaders as being one world religion. But then again, the people say that, you know, they're, they're, they're going to force Islam on the people. No, I couldn't be really like that because even as Chuck Missler points out, this particular guy, he's got many different titles in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, quite a few in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, a a few, I think it's like 11 different titles he's called by, the son of perdition being one of those, uh, that man of sin and different ones of that nature there. So, but when Chuck looks at that, he, he brings out the fact that the Antichrist or this man of sin that comes on the scene will cause both small and great, quoting from the scripture, they're both small and great to receive a mark in their forehead or in their hand. If they don't, what? If they don't, you know, in order to be able to buy and to sell, to be able to interchange in commerce is one of the reasons why it's believed that he will control the world economy, control a new world order, a new world government, like we've seen uh, George Bush Sr. bring out during his administration. It is time for a new world order. And so both Christians and non-Christians of like have really been concerned about this new world order, trying to figure out who the man is that has this ability, this type of charisma to do it. But remember, the Bible says he comes in peaceably. That's what Chuck pointed out in one of his uh, teachings that I was looking at recently. He comes in peaceably. And we know that. We see that the scripture speaks about that. And in fact, the Bible says they will say peace, peace, and there is no peace. So all kinds of things that we can, we can look to there. Um, but I want to go right into this message here, and let's begin to examine this. Now, when it comes to the economics, if we were to consider Obama as a possible candidate for the Antichrist and to bring about a one-world monetary system, uh, we have to ask ourselves this question here. He's the President of the United States. Does the United States have the ability to lead a one-world economic system? I don't think so. 
the last that we've been hearing, and it's all over the world in the news, especially, you don't see it as much in the United States, U.S. news, but you definitely see it overseas. You see it in Israel, you see it in, you see it in the European news, you see it in the Russian news, uh, and even you can get RT news in the United States now, and they will tell you that the U.S. dollar is on the verge of collapse. Anyone that knows anything about uh, the analysts, and, and of course, even uh, you have Jonathan Kahn that has actually stated this as well, that in 2015 this year, in September, according to the book that he wrote, uh, on the next milestone for the United States is a total economic collapse. Well, that kind of leaves the United States out about being the world uh, financial leader. What about the EU? What about the European Union? Well, even the European Union is struggling. Germany kind of helps hold that together. England didn't want to be a part of it because England does have a powerhouse of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a financial dollar. But the thing is, is none of these countries have the gold to back it. Neither does Russia, the Russian ruble or the, or the Japanese yen or anyone else. All these economies are on the brink of destruction. If one falls, they all fall. And of course, the Vatican has even said that they would like to reset up a financial, insti financial institution and they would like to be the head of a new wor one world banking system. Imagine that. Well, so the question that comes up is how rich is the Catholic Church? Uh, there was an article put out by Matthew uh, Iglesias and in and and the, the title of the article, he says, How Rich Is the Catholic Church? says, Nobody really knows because religious groups don't need to follow regular accounting and disclosure rules. That's interesting, isn't it? Isn't it? Of course, if you're a 501c, it's a little bit different from 501c's, uh, which we are not a part of. I will not be a part of a 501c because that means the government controls you, tells you what you can and cannot say. You don't believe me? Ask John Hagee. He bowed down recently to, to world pressure, world political pressure, and of course, the pressure against the Vatican. He's now clamming up because, no doubt, he was forced to shut up. Anyway, Pope Francis is not just the spiritual leader of the one world's uh, major religions. He is also the head of what is probably the wealthiest institution in the entire world. The Catholic Church's global spending matches the annual revenues of the planet's largest firms and its assets. Huge amounts of real estate, St. Patrick's Cathedral, Vatican City, some of the world's greatest art surely exceeds those of any corporation by any uh, order or magnitude. Now, also in the book that I wrote, Israel, Are They Still God's People? I bring this out from an older edition of another article that came out and show how that they hold the majority of stocks in many of the major companies. Uh, I forget exactly who all they are, but I remember some of them like Microsoft, Apple, uh, just the list goes on and on and on. Coca-Cola company, McDonald's. Uh, in fact, all you have to do is see which companies are the main companies in Europe and the United States only to know which ones are owned by the, or have a lot of stock by the Vatican because they promote those particular companies. In fact, as the European Union is spreading in Europe, a lot of people talk about here, the small companies that were here once they came under the European Union were closed up and the brand that was all through the European Union became the new stores of these new states. Uh, very interesting. So they're controlling the financial, the buying and uh, selling already, uh, which anybody that knows the European Union was signed in front of one of the largest statues of a pope uh, in, in here in Europe. Uh, so we'll be bringing more on that here in the, in the coming months here. So uh, at, at any rate, the estimated value says here, our best window into overall financial picture of American Catholicism comes from a 2012 investigation by economists which offered a rough and ready estimate of $170 billion in annual spending, of which almost $150 billion is associated with church-affiliated hospitals and institutions of higher education. The operating budget for ordinary parishes at around $11 billion a year is relatively small share, and Catholic charities is a smaller share still. Uh, you know, incredible, $170 billion uh, is what they deal with in annually. This doesn't count all the gold assets, the art assets that they have. Um, you know, they got another interesting look uh, in an article from American Bankruptcy Institute Journal explains that the status of a parish investment funds depends on some very subtle details. Both Diocese of Milwaukee and Diocese of Wilmington ran 
pooled investment funds in which a single account simply noted how much each parish had contributed. The difference is that Wilmington delivered operating funds were also mingled into the pooled account where in Milwaukee they were kept separate. That small difference ended up costing Wilmington parishes $74 million in exposure of Episcopal creditors. I mean, it's, it's unimaginable the wealth that the Vatican has. No wonder why they want to control the world's financial institution. They want to make sure they get their money back. In fact, if you don't know it, all the taxes from the United States happens to go to Britain and where the Queen sits on that money. That's why she's so close to the Pope as well, the Queen of England, and they gather the taxes for the Pope of Rome. Uh, so, I interestingly enough, um, now, the thing is, we see that they have the financial ability to do it. The other question is, is what about bringing about a political environment? Can they bring about a new world order? Last year, and I have not been able to see if I can get a statistic on this to prove this, but last year alone, it appears to be that the, the most hosted world leaders was done by the Vatican. It's very obvious, of course, George Bush, or not George Bush, but uh, President Barack Obama, he sees all kinds of different world leaders himself, but no one sees as many world leaders as what the Pope of Rome does. He deals with more world leaders, and, and, and what's really strange is he deals with every world leader when there's conflicts, they all come to him. In fact, Shimon Peres said that there's no one that can bring about peace in Israel other than the Pope of Rome, Pope Francis. Uh, we see that Obas goes to the Pope because of the two-state conflict. John Kerry goes to him. Barack Obama goes to him over the same two-state conflict. Even Hamas, who the Pope backs, goes to Rome. So we're seeing every leader that you can imagine, the Iranians send their delegation, the, all the Muslim leaders of the world, whether it be from Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, they all send their heads of states to the Vatican to discuss different issues. Even the Syrian president, uh, Bashar Assad, sent a, a statement to the Vatican saying what they would do a ceasefire on, what agreement they would be willing to do a ceasefire on. Why would they send this, this declaration to the Vatican? Why not the United Nations? Well, the United Nations is run by the Vatican as well. In fact, the European Union is set up underneath the, the guidelines of the Vatican. It's kind of odd if you think about it because the European Union flag actually has 12 stars in a circle, just like the 12 stars that are circled around uh, the statues of Mary throughout all of the Catholic churches all over the world representing that they are the 12 apostles and that they have come up under the authority of the Vatican. Very interesting to see. All of, of course, all of Europe's leaders go to the Vatican and the African leaders go to the Vatican and all the politics, the Russian president Vladimir Putin goes to the Vatican. Uh, you have North South Korea leaders. They speak with the Vatican, the Philippines leaders. In fact, the Pope of Rome is going to the Philippines coming up here this month. Uh, it, it seems that there's not a world leader anywhere that the Vatican doesn't have contact with. We also know and discovered recently in some of the articles that came out about the Cuba agreement with Barack Obama that it was secret meetings between the Vatican that actually helped Barack Obama secure this deal and, and bring about peace, not so much peace, but allowing a new uh, agreement with Cuba and new relations with a communist state. In fact, Obama says we can't beat him. We just might as well find another way to do it. Why? Because the Pope of Rome is forcing his hand. All the South American leaders go to the Vatican as well. The list just goes on and on. And, you know, it's like I can't even get it all out. There's so many. And so, therefore, who has the ability to bring about a one world order? The Pope of Rome has that ability. It's very obvious he controls the world. All the political leaders of the world go to the Pope. And by the way, if any of you may not know, you cannot have an audience with the Pope unless you bow down. Even if you're not doing it publicly, you bow down to him and you kiss his ring. That is your sign of allegiance to the Pope. It's also stated that any country the Pope visits is a country that has been conquered by the Vatican. As they say today in Europe, that Europe is now a revived Roman Empire. 
We're going to get into a little bit later about the Roman Empire or the Babylonian kingdom during the time when Yeshua was on the earth and how that kingdom has been revived today and who actually destroyed, who destroyed the second temple. We'll get into that as well as we go along. Anyway, now we look at uh, if the Vatican has that uh, power there, what about the churches? Who's going to unite all the faiths? We definitely know Islam is not going to unite them. I haven't seen anybody yet that is willing to say that we'll let the Islamic leaders have the head. What are we going to have? We're going to have a Mahdi come be the head of the world's religions? Well, the thing is, is people like, like, um, uh, gosh, sorry about this. When you, when you take uh, Perry Stone, for example, Perry Stone believes that the United States is going to be totally conquered by Islam and therefore the government will force the Islamic religion on the entire world. That's his idea on this. But in reality, now I don't doubt that Islam doesn't play a major role in causing havoc because that's exactly what the Vatican has done for the last 2,000 years. That's why the Vatican created the Islamic religion. And we owe this to Alberta Rivera, who was a former Jesuit that came out of the Catholic Church 25 years as a Jesuit and exposed the very inner workings, the secret things that go on in the secret societies of the Jesuit order. And he revealed to us that the Vatican and some of the most secret documents known in the Vatican uh, Church there in, in Rome, that they clearly teach that the Vatican is the one that created Islam. We've done videos on this before, and there's many people that do videos. You have Alan Lamont, excellent, excellent expositor on the Vatican, the Jesuits, the Illuminati. If you want someone that knows that, Alan Lamont is the man that knows it. He knows it inside and out. And so the thing is, is when we're looking at this and we're trying to figure out, sorry about scratching my nose constantly. I keep, I keep, I got, I got two itches, one on the back of my neck and one on the tip of my nose, and I can't get rid of either one of them. So uh, anyway, forgive me. But anyway, so, so the thing is, is Alberto Rivera, he really exposed a lot of this. He, spoke, he told us about how that, uh, according to the historical documentation, that there was an Arabic girl who was a loyal convert to the Catholic Church, uh, she, a very wealthy woman. Her name was Kanji. She gave her wealth over to the Catholic Church when she came in to believing what they taught. Uh, and then, of course, the Catholic Church, knowing that they needed to suppress the growing numbers of true Christians that were growing as a result of the apostles and the, uh, the, 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 the apostles' efforts and the converts that they had won to Christ, including Paul's converts, but especially the ones among the Jewish people. They were growing throughout northern Africa and the Middle East. And, but they weren't in agreement with what the Catholic Church that was formed in 325 uh, AD, they weren't in agreement with them. Constantine who ca had came together with church leaders, formed the Catholic Church, and they made an official state religion. Uh, they, they were also the, uh, well, it's not just that the, you know, the, the Bible we have today, let me say this, the, 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 a lot of people use King James Version, and, and I do appreciate the King James Version. I know there's a lot of different translations out there. Uh, you know, but a lot of what we do have, the canons that we do have, were influenced as well at uh, Nicaea, Rome. Now, it's not to say that the canons that were brought in there were not biblical, true canons. They were. But the issue is, is what did they not want us to know about? It seems like anything that maybe went against what they were planning for their doctrine is the scriptures they didn't want you knowing about. They also didn't want you to know about women that were in the Bible that had written uh, different books. In fact, more recently in scholastic research, it appears that the book of Hebrews was never written by Paul, although we do know it's a biblical canon and perfectly in line with the scripture. But the author is actually believed to be a woman. In fact, it's believed to be Priscilla. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that we can get in on that. But the point is, is church and state had united. And so therefore, it was the church's interpretation controlled by the state at that time uh, that decided to put to death anybody that didn't agree with them. So the true believing Christians ended up being murdered, not only by the Romans, but they uh, they brought together their relationships that they had with Islam and they created a religion in Islam, excuse me, in, in the Muslim world, the Islamic religion, uh, when they found the, the young man called Muhammad and they had Kaji married him. And when Kaji married him, of course, he was undoubtedly attracted by money because she's a very wealthy woman. And 
what what ensued after that marriage there was they went into northern Africa. He was with some uh, Catholic monks up there. They tutored him, and Muhammad never wrote anything, so they had to write it for him. This is one reason why in the Islamic religion you see that there's such similarities between the two. It's why the nuns and the women in Islam both dress the same. It's why they both use rosary beads, in fact. It's why you both see the crescent moon so often in both their religions. You see the sun wafer in the, uh, uh, of, the, of what's called the, uh, the sacrament, the bread, in the Vatican for the sun god etc etc on down and uh, so they merge the two and they're also they're not against Mary and they're not against Jesus per se why because the Vatican created the religion so they don't want to bash what they believe in anyway getting a little bit off track the whole point is though is they raised up Islam in order to defeat their enemies and that's what they will do again today so when you see like Perry Stone talking about the Islamic uh, movement in the United States and that they will rise up to conquer the U.S., he may be right on the money there. But when it comes to who the Antichrist is that influences them, it will not be the Mahdi. You have to remember the Vatican wanted to, to, to get the attention off of themselves because the early true Christians knew that this Vatican was where that Antichrist spirit was going to come from. So they created another religion and they wrote in that text that they called the Quran, that there would be a Mahdi, a Islamic Antichrist that would come on the scene. Anything they can to get their attention off of that. Even like today, many evangelical leaders have changed their opinions and now they're preaching a Muslim Mahdi. What caused them to change? Well, we might see the answer to this as we look at this a little further. So therefore, as we begin to look at the person that can bring about a one world religion, now we're seeing that all the religions of the world are going to the Vatican, especially during the time when, when they were trying to bring about a two-state solution in Israel. Now remember, a lot of times we look at that and we say, well, it never happened. Nine months negotiations didn't bring about nothing. You might think it didn't bring about nothing. I believe it did. I can't say that it's signed yet. But I do believe that those nine-month negotiations produced two states. I know this because living in Israel, I actually know some of the very top leaders there. And I've actually had personal conversations with United Nations people that have said to me that they're going back to a pre-1967 border. And we see that there's a lot of political issues going on in and around Israel. We see political leaders making decisions Stopping the, 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 the military in Israel from being able to protect the citizens the proper way. We see the Palestinians, the so-called Palestinians, on an uprise against the Jewish people. Boldness like they've never had before. We see all kind of concessions, but nothing is in favor of the Jewish people. Why? Some kind of agreement has been reached somewhere along the way. In fact, Moshe Faglin did not, he was not allowed to see what was going on. They didn't have observers in the county during the time when Prime Minister Netanyahu, they were doing the runoff for who would be the head of the Likud party to run for the election for that. Could something have happened there? Who knows? But the thing is, is a lot of evil goes on in politics. It doesn't matter if it's in Israel or any other part of the world. There's an agenda going on in the background and they're controlling who gets into what office in what part of the world. But nonetheless, God does have a remnant, a true believing group of people in Israel, true Jews, that he has called to be his people. So while the Pope is uniting the world religions together, and some people are calling it now Chrislam, we see that he does bring forth a uniting front. In fact, the Bible says that the great whore of Revelation, she is the mother of harlots and all abominations of the earth. Well, we know the abomination happens to be Islam for one. But he's also united the Hindus. He's united the Muslim people. He's bringing them together. He's the only one that was able to bring the Muslim, the Christian, and the Jewish leaders together. And it's a shame to see that both Christian and Jews were willing to come together with him and be a part of any of these meetings. He is the one that is trying to bring out peace. Remember Chuck Messer made that comment I told you about. He's quoting the Bible, of course. He said he'll be a man that is, appears to be bringing forth peace. And that's exactly what the Pope of Rome is doing. He is one of the greatest orators I've ever seen in the world. 
And he's in every magazine imaginable. I know when I was in the United States, I had magazine after magazine after magazine. I'd see him on the newsstand, and I would buy him, and I would keep him. He was on Time Magazine, People Magazine, uh, Man of the Year, everything you could think of, the Pope is on there. And the world is lifting him up as if he's some kind of Messiah. And we think about the word Antichristo. He's like Christ. He's also worshipped as if he were God, is he not? Now, the thing is, is, it's not only that, though, but many evangelical leaders have actually turned to the Pope in large numbers like never before. And I've, I've listed some of the names. You have John Hagee. Tony Palmer kind of spearheaded this himself. Tony Palmer, supposedly Tony Palmer has died. I think his death is a little bit odd. On that, I've had people say, send, send me comments about that, and yes, I did look into that, and, and I do think there's some interest to that. I think it's something worth watching to see what really develops. Uh, I'm, I never knew of a funeral, per se, that they had for him, so I don't know. I, he's in a motorcycle accident, and, you know, the Pope seemed to love him so much, and yet no big to, deal, to do over his death. This is kind of odd, isn't it? But anyway, Tony Palmer kicked all this off. John Hagee has turned and apologized and came back to the Catholic Church. Kenneth Copeland, Pat Robertson, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, Russell Moore, Charles Colson, Steve Sheldon, Richard Land, Larry Lewis, Kent Hill, John White, Brian O'Connell. These are some of the most well-known names in different religion circles of the world. And that's just Americans that I'm giving you. Not even speaking about the great leaders of different uh, religions of all other parts of the world. Why is the Pope on such a bent to unite all the religions of the world? And he's openly said, come back to the Mother Church. Even, even the great crusader Billy Graham saying that it was the most religious experience he'd ever had meeting with the Pope of Rome. That was Pope John Paul II. So... <laughs> I, I, I'm just blown away. And some of the names you may not be familiar with, like Dr. Ken Hill, he's a uh, Eastern Nazarene College. He's the head of that. Um, uh, oh, by the way, too, another one that I was kind of blown away by is a guy that actually uh, put together, he's the founder of the, uh, what is that Bible? It's, a, it's an online Bible app that you can get. It's very popular, and I can't think of the name of it. But he has a personal interview with the Pope. Now it kind of concerns me there, too, So, but whatever. Uh, Herbert Skolsberg, he's the director of the Fieldstead Foundation uh, and co-author of Turning Point. Um, Dr. John White, Geneva College and National Association of Evangelicals. Dr. Larry Lewis, Home Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. You know, so in case you don't know some of these names, I figured I'd let you know some, uh, who some of these people are. Now, here's the one that really gets you. And we're going to go into the biblical aspect of this very shortly here. I just want to build for you to show you Who's got the ability? Who's the guy that's bringing about a new world order? Who's the guy bringing about a one world religion? Who's the guy that's got the ability to bring about a one world economic system? Because believe me, if all the economies in the world collapse, he's the only one with the gold that can do it. So think about that. There's an article that came out not too long ago, and it says McCain backer John Hagee apologizes to Catholics. You know, John Hagee, I have a lot of respect for John Hagee. I did in the past anyway. And I've had people uh, that know John Hagee that go to his church uh, there in Texas. When I was in the United States uh, last, year, or this, yeah, last year, there were people that, that flew up uh, to meet us when we, were doing, uh, with, when we were part of the conference in Indianapolis, Indiana, that, were, that knew John Hagee personally. They, go to, they attend his church, and they'll probably be listening to this video and I, I hope that they're shocked as much as I am when he actually did this. Now, you got to keep in mind, John Hagee has a huge ministry in Israel. Uh, he's always been a passionate supporter of Israel. And yet Israel's greatest enemy is Rome. But the thing is, it's not, in one way, it's really not that big of a surprise to me because look at what's happened to the politicians. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who was a, really a man for, for, for Israel, when he first became prime minister many years ago, the first time, you know, but as soon as he got into politics, the pressures of the world and the pressures of all the governments of the world and the pressures of Rome made him bow. And you got the only one that I knew recently is Moshe Faglin that was against a two-state solution. No wonder why they made sure 
that he didn't get on the ballot? Was there really that much concern that he might win the election and beat John, uh, excuse me, Prime Minister Netanyahu? You know, so my concern is great. John Hagee says here, the controversy of evangelical pastor who endorsed John McCain will issue a letter of apology to Catholics today for inflammatory remarks he made, including accusing the Roman Catholic Church of supporting Adolf Hitler and calling it the great whore. I will never apologize for that. And let me tell you something. There is influence. There are people very powerful, very influential that do come to leaders and try to get you to change. I had that happen as well. And what makes it tough, of course, I wouldn't bow, period, but what makes it tough, you end up becoming very good friends with these people. And that's how it, it comes about. You see, the Vatican is not stupid. They end up having you make friends in, inadvertently. You may not realize it at the time, but you end up becoming friends with influential people. I know people from the United Nations. I know envoys, special envoys of the United Nations. I, I know uh, people that are, that are close to Vladimir Putin. I know people that are close to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I know people that are very close to Barack Obama. They work with these people every day of their lives. I know these people. And what happens is sometimes one of those type people come to you, and it happened to me. And I was asked to tread very carefully about what I say about Rome. And it was said to me very nicely, very kindly. And I believe that the person maybe in their heart really and truly believes that they're doing the right thing as well. But they're forging a relationship with Rome. But I refuse to be a part of it. And I would not back my ground up. I would not stand with Rome. John Hagee, though, on the other hand, the pressure got to him. He says, out of a desire to advance greater unity among Catholics and evangelicals in promoting the common good, I want to express my deep regret for any comments that Catholics have found hurtful. Hagee wrote, according to an advanced copy of the letter reviewed by the Washington Wire, after engaging in constructive dialogue with the Catholic friends and leaders, I now have an improved understanding of the Catholic Church, its relationship to the Jewish faith and the history of anti-Catholicism. I'm going to expose what their relationship is to the Jewish people. In a letter addressed to Bill Donahue, president of the Catholic League and one of Hagee's biggest critics, Hagee pledges a greater level of compassion and respect for my Catholic brothers and sisters in Christ, as he put it. The people in the Catholic Church, there are many good godly people there, no doubt. God says, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her plagues. You need to come out. John Hagee, if you don't repent and come out, you will be a partaker of her plagues. And you know that. Hagee met with 22 Catholic leaders in Washington on Friday to apologize for his comments, according to the source familiar with the meeting. Despite the McCain condemnation of Hagee's anti-Catholic remarks that came uh, campaign had no role in that meeting or Tuesday's apology, according to the source who said it was something Hagee did because he felt it was necessary. Sure he did. What are they threatening him with? What, is the IRS going to audit him or something? Was he going to be kicked out of Israel? You know, that's what makes it hard for me as well. Because when you want to say what's really the truth, you're not wanted in very many places. Anyway, this was on uh, uh, www.blogs.wsj.com, washwire, forward slash 2008, forward slash 05, forward slash 13, McCain, backer, John Hagee, apologizes to Catholics, uh, hyphens in between those words here. So at, at any rate, it's sad to see what's happening. Uh, and as you can see clearly, and not just him, Joel Osteen, Oh, such a great moving experience, as he says on a video meeting with him. Kenneth Copeland, when Tony Palmer, Tony Palmer brought Kenneth Copeland in, and what did they do? They had this big, uh, they had a big convention. He gets the Pope to make a little YouTube, or a little video on his cell phone. He goes there before Kenneth Copeland, and they were having a, a big meeting with all the different evangelical leaders of big churches. As Tony Palmer put it, they were big fish, people that had private jets, Private jets in the ministry. Now that's a hoot. 
Whatever happened about preaching the gospel? You know, it's a lot cheaper just to catch a plane. You know the money you could spend in helping people instead of buying a private jet? Oh, well. I guess you don't want me on that toot either. But anyway, um, what happened with Kenneth Copeland there, he also sucked right into the church. See, the thing is, is th and there's a lot of people, even Alan Lamont, I'm sure, is a is supporter of this idea as well. Jesuits have infiltrated all these churches. They became the church leaders of the evangelical movement. They're the ones that became famous. Why? To get you to follow them, and when you follow them, then they're able to lead you astray. John Hagee, though, I believe, was probably a really good man. But he's under that pressure. And it's sad, very sad. Um, anyway, there's also a, a Baptist uh, that goes to the Catholic Church, that went to the Catholic Church. You know, all this kind of stuff got started, and especially in Israel, what happened? The Jews have no more say-so. No more say-so. The Jews are totally without say-so now. You know, back on, uh, and I don't know if I've got the date on this, at David's tomb, yes, on uh, last year, on, the, on June 9th of 2014, is when they first published an article that the Vatican actually did a communion service on the Temple Mount. It was in Israel's national news. They do a communion service uh, atop of, the, of, of, of King David's tomb in the place that is called the, the Last Supper. It's the traditional spot. It's owned by the Catholic Church there. And the, 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 the Israeli government gave this property without any, any public uh, forum of any kind. They gave it over to Rome. They got Mount Zion. And then they took the week later, they did a communion service inside of King David's tomb. I thought that was... Something for the Jewish people. See, the Jews don't have anything there. Even when we went to the Temple Institute one time on a tour there, the tour guide said, Israel has no control whatsoever over Jerusalem. I believe it. I have no idea why the Lord showed me in that dream that time about the man drinking on his holy mountain. And some people wrote me and said, Zion, Mount Zion is not God's holy mountain. You need to read your Bible again because it is his holy mountain. And he said, remove that man. Hmm. Anyway, let's go right into the word there. I, I, I know it's being long and I don't want to overspend my time, your, your time and your patience in listening. I want to take you first to Genesis chapter 36 and verse 43. That's where we're going to go to. Uh, this is from the King James Version. I have multiple versions as I'm working with this. Because some things I want to read to you in Hebrew, some I don't need to, but some I'll do for emphasis says, Duke uh, Magdiel, Duke uh, Iram, these be the dukes of Edom. According to their habitation in the land of their possession, he is Esau, the father of the Edomites. So I just want to bring that out so you know who that uh, Edom is. Edom is, or, or Edom or the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. That's the biblical passage for that. To make that clear, the midrash is very clear as well. They, they, when you, if you study the midrash, uh, it's not a biblical text. So I don't say that you need to or have to. For Jews, it's kind of like if you're listening to Chuck Missler or, or Chuck Swindoll or Perry Stone or any of these guys here, the midrash is just the same thing. It's commentaries uh, by other Jewish rabbis over the centuries there, and some of them are very interesting. But they've done very deep studies there as well, tracing the lineage of Esau. Uh, something that was a big thing for us to do anyway, because you have to remember Esau is a descendant of Abraham. He was uh, uh, Isaac's son, Isaac and Rebekah's son, uh, Jacob and Esau. And of course, we know the hatred that came between the two of them when they were born and how God uh, says in the word of God in the, in, in the Christian Bible, the New Testament, says that uh, I have hated Esau and I have loved Jacob. Uh, we see a lot of things about Esau, but ironically, if you think about it, even the, the prophecies in there about Esau or Edom, where God uh, accuses him of being at his brother's throat, uh, or, you know, and the evils that he did in some places, killing and everything else, it's actually prophetic because Esau, uh, after Jacob comes back, we never see where Esau does anything evil to Jacob. Uh, he actually accepts him, which is kind of ironic. So we know that these are prophetic. Uh, anyway, let's move right along now. We want to go into um, uh, uh, 
Okay, she, uh, this, this scripture here is also from Genesis, and I did not write down where it's at. I think I may have where this is at, but maybe not. Anyway, it's, uh, the scripture here I want to read to you is, you know, one second. We'll... Okay, uh, I want to take you to Genesis chapter 30, verse 24. And this is a little interesting here. And I actually picked this up from a commentary by uh, Rabbi Emmanuel Shachet. Uh, and he quotes part of the Midrash in this, but it's very interesting uh, to, to see this and kind of set a little bit of the stage for us. And she called his name Joseph, saying, The Lord add to me another son. Yosef, Yahiyahe, Li ben Achal. When I read this, I was really blown away, especially the commentary, because when you look at that, Yosef, Yahioe, Li ben Achal, the Lord add to me another son. Now, this is, this is uh, Rachel having Joseph, and of course we know God gives her Benjamin, but it's actually prophetic. And according to uh, some of the uh, Jewish beliefs here, which is very interesting because it does come to pass later, it's speaking of the coming Messiah. And I just want to read to you real quick one little quote here. This ultimate confrontation between Joseph and Esau, this is what they look at on this particular verse here, is alluded already in the very birth of Joseph when his mother, Rachel, exclaimed, God has taken away my disgrace. That's in verse 23, by the way. With prophetic vision, she foresaw that the anointed Savior will descend from Joseph and that he will remove the disgrace of Israel. In this context, she called his name Yosef. Yosef Hashem, may God add to me ben Acher, um, uh, which is the Hebrew part, Yosef, uh, uh, li ben Acher. You know, may the Lord add to me another son. Now, the, the interesting thing here, the rabbi writes this, and he looks at that as being uh, the son of Joseph, ben Yosef, that it would become, that that would be the Messiah and they failed to recognize that Christ indeed was that Ben Yosef, you know. And so they separate it. They have the, you know, the son of David, uh, Ben David, and they have Ben Yosef. And they didn't recognize that Christ was that Joseph that came. And of course, we know the story of Joseph is so, so ironically the same as uh, the life of Yeshua. And so why they miss that when it's actually right, written right in the, the Midrash as well. Um, in fact, it says there, uh, from which it follows that uh, Moshiach Melachma, one anointed for battle, will descend from Joseph. This is in the Midrash, uh, Yelamadinu, cities and country, uh, cited in countries. Uh, that's only, in other words, that's one of the very few uh, Midrashes that actually have that quotation. And it's funny, they took it out. They took it out because... They don't want the Jews knowing that the Midrash actually wrote about Joseph being a type or a forerunner of Christ. So very interesting. I just thought I'd share that with you because in there also their belief is, is that, uh, that that son will be the one that will destroy the Romans, the Roman enemies. Another reason why the Jews did not accept the fact that Yeshua was indeed the Messiah because they expected him to come to destroy the Romans when he came because they know that the Romans are the descendants of Esau and it didn't happen. So it kind of it kind of threw them off. Uh, but I anyway, um, also in Zechariah 12 is, is something that they refer to. Uh, Moshiach ben David comes again. That's where they believe it's Moshiach ben David, but it's actually the same. It's one and the same. It's the Messiah himself. It's Yeshua. Uh, as we know, uh, Jesus. Now, let's go. I want to take you, and this is where it's going to get really interesting. And I've done this with you guys before. We're going to be doing it again. Obadiah. Uh, by the way, if you don't know who, uh, who Obadiah really was, I know there's a lot of controversy amongst scholars who was Obadiah to begin with, because it doesn't mention who his father and mother was. But there's a lot of good, uh, sound uh, debate that it was actually Ahab's uh, servant Obadiah, the one that actually saved and rescued the prophets uh, and kept them alive that God anointed him uh, to, to also to prophesy. And so he wrote the book of Obadiah. And it is a grand book in itself because it reveals who Esau's descendants would be all the way down through time. It's a very interesting book there. Uh, and I think it's very important, too, because why? During the time that Ahab reigned, Ahab was dealing with the descendants of Esau out of Syria. Because why? We already know, the, know that Hadad 
who escaped the sword of David as a little bitty child and some of the Edomite servants. Now, that, those servants may have been uh, descendants of, uh, of Esau as well. I don't know. But the one little boy was. He goes over into, uh, into Egypt. He flee, they, they take him there. He's brought into Pharaoh's house. He's reared as a, as a royal son of Pharaoh. When he becomes of age, he actually marries uh, the sister to Pharaoh's uh, wife. And uh, in so doing, when he becomes of age, he requires ask him to go. Uh, actually, here's what's ironic. He hears of the death of King David. And when he hears of the death of King David, now he wants to actually go home, as he puts it. He goes to Syria and becomes the king of Syria. All right, and so this is what this is what the uh, this is where the the later Ahab is faced with, and also uh, we know that Hezekiah gets involved in this. Uh, just I mean, Jehoshaphat got involved in that war a little bit uh, to his own folly, but uh, of course he survived. But he gets involved in that war as well. Well, these are these are Hadad's descendants that they're fighting. These are the Romans. These are the Edomites, so to speak, the the, the descendants of Esau. And, uh, and, of course, they take, they take out the ten northern tribes in this battle. They totally wipe them out. Uh, many of the women are raped. Uh, it's where we get the Samaritan race from. But, uh, but, but in, in hindsight there, the, the sad thing about all of this is that uh, uh, the, the ten northern tribes are dispersed through all the world. It's the first dispersion before the house of Judah. And it is actually because of Esau's children. Obadiah is going to set this story straight for us. So let's take a look at this. Uh, and some things the Lord has revealed to me today that I think will be a really uh, blessing for you as well. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 1, the vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. So first he's going to tell you what's going to be the outcome of Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord. An ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised that's interesting she is small among the heathen the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock whose habitation is high that saith in his heart who shall bring me down to the ground though thou exalt thyself as an eagle and though thou set thy nest amongst the stars Thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. That's King James Version right there that I read to you. Now, here's what's very interesting in the first four verses here. By the way, to go ahead and let you know, I'm going to prove to you from Obadiah's readings that Rome, modern-day Rome, as well as Rome 2,000 years ago during the times of Yeshua, was indeed, and even before that, 2,100 years ago, 2,200 years ago, was the descendants of Adam the descendants of Esau. This is why we see all the different prophecies in the Bible about Esau and Jacob. It's about this battle. This is what it's all about. Now, here's what's interesting, though. He says, I've made thee small among the heathen. Even though David went out there and he killed all of them except Hadad, Hadad escapes alone. You know, so basically Hadad is like an intermix of Esau and what? The Arabic world. That's why you see the Vatican get, gets along so well with the Muslims. It's their brothers. They're half brothers. They're half Islamic people. And so they can easily mingle amongst the Islamic world. They married in among them. And you know, the other thing is, too, that you got to look at here. He says, I've made these small among the heathen. In Rome is its own state sitting in Italy. And I would venture to say, I didn't do the research to see this for sure, it is considered a country of its own. It has its own bank, its own currency. But I would venture to say it's the smallest country, if not in all the world, the smallest one in Europe. Because he said, I have made thee small among the heathen or among the nations. They're among the nations. And yes, Rome is among the nations, are they not? Here's what's the other interesting thing here. He says, Though thou, verse 4, Though thou exalt thyself as the, as the eagle, and thou set thy nest among the stars. What stars is he talking about? I can't help but wonder if this doesn't allude to the European Union 
itself. The very flag, the circle of stars, just like they have over Mary's head. The circle of stars representing the 12 apostles, according to them. That's why the European Union has this flag, showing that what? They're all under the Vatican rule. Thence I will bring thee down, saith the Lord. Hmm. By the way, in Hebrew it says, Ben Kochachanim. That's how you say. Literally, between the stars. Ben ben Kochachanim. Between the stars. Interesting. Oh, gosh. In Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 12, says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which this weaken the nations? Do you know what that actually means? In Hebrew, it is cholesh al goim. Cholesh. Cholesh literally is to dominate the nations. And it's through their dominating of the nations that weakens the nations. That's why you normally see the word weakens the nations. But in Hebrew, it literally means to dominate them. And that's what the Rome has actually done. I wanted to bring that out to you so you could see that. Because who, who does it? Satan does it. Remember, the Antichrist, just like the son of perdition, Judas Iscariot, he is one of the 12 apostles. Pope of Rome, actually, the, 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 the Pope actually claims to be one of the apostles himself because he claims that Peter was the first apostle, the head of the church. And so, therefore, the Pope of Rome today would be considered an apostle of modern days. Well, I would agree they're like Judas, that's for sure, because Judas was the son of perdition. And we know in the final days, the Antichrist is also called the son of perdition. So what would he be? One of the apostles. A religious figure, one that claims to love Jesus Christ. And if you think about it, even the apostles loved Mary. Now, Mary, certainly the very virgin mother that gave birth to the Lord Jesus, you know, HaMashiach, Yeshua HaMashiach, she is worthy as a sister in the Lord, but not to be worshipped. Not to be worshipped. That's totally wrong. Isaiah 14, verse 13. Now, I'm sorry, I read verse 12 is where it said he did weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, these are scriptures about Satan, by the way, said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Remember what Obadiah just said here? Thou, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars. Interesting, isn't it? I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. See, the Pope is over the church. But yet Satan said he's going to be the one that sits on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Think about it. Israel sits right here, directly north of Israel is Turkey, and just to the side of Turkey, we have, of course, Greece and Rome, in the sides of the north. So Rome is northwest of Israel. Interesting, isn't it? According to Obadiah, though, it's the Lord, it's Yahiai that brings him down. Isaiah 14, verse 14 says, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. What did Obadiah say? Thence will I bring thee down, saith Yahweh. God's going to bring him down. And he says he's going to bring him down to hell. Everything Obadiah is seeing here is exactly what Isaiah was saying. That's what I find interesting. Let's go on to Obadiah uh, verse 5. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how are they cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to, to, to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? 
All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. All the men of thy confederacy. Ad hagavoel. Shalachucha. Kol anashe baritach. It's not just that they're a confederacy. They've made a covenant. Now, isn't that kind of interesting? I mean, we just talked about something like this not long ago. Let's go to Psalm. Those of you that caught this first uh, part of this video on this uh, before I decided to remake this here, you, you know what I'm talking about here now, I'm sure. All right. Keep thou not silence, O God. Hold not thy peace and be not still. Psalm 83. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Now, there's a couple of things. Oh, my gosh. This is so important. All right. Make the old mouse work here, boy, because I've got you guys have got to know about this one here. All right. Let me bring up for you the Hebrew Bible here. And uh, we bring right up here to Psalm 83. Because I want you to see this in here. Okay. Oh, God, keep not thou silent. Hold not thy peace and be not still, O God, for lo, thy enemies are in an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Now, mm. Surosh. See, they've lifted up their head, their leader. And what's kind of interesting, though, if you think about it, in the midst of the stars. Oh, gosh. Okay. Let me get to the main part of this. I, get, I don't want to get sidetracked for you. For lo, thine enemies are in an uproar. See? God, whose enemies? God's enemies. They're in an uproar. And they are in an uproar. Verse 4. They hold crafty uh, converse against thy people and take counsel against thy treasured ones. <laughs> All right. Verse 4. Literally, alam alamcha, all right? That is against your people. That's what that means right there, alamcha. Yari musod. They prepare secretly. And they counsel against sufanecha, thy hidden ones. Now, they're, they're, in other words, you have to understand, in Hebrew here, this council here that they're doing here, that they're having, they're holding a council against God's people and they're doing it secretly. Now this council is, is literally in Hebrew, in modern Hebrew, we use this as a term for like a councilman meeting. Like if you were going to go to uh, a group where they're sitting in a room and they're making a decision. And according to the prophecy in Psalm 83, they're doing secret meetings, just like the Pope of Rome had secret meetings with Barack Obama about Cuba. They're having secret meetings about the people of Israel, God's people, not the political part of the people. They're having it about the remnant. They're having it about the ones that don't go along with their plan. Moshe Faglin, you I guess you would fall into that category right there because you don't go along with it. Think of all the different rabbis that don't go along with their plan either. And I pray to God, Rabbi uh, Winston, Rabbi uh, Mitzrachi, I pray to you, pray also for, for, for Rabbi uh, Singer, I pray that none of you fall into this. Don't go with Rome. That's what they want to do. They're having a secret meetings, a council. They're doing a secret council. So it's so a secret. Belisa Dot is a famous little cartoon I used to watch years ago and everything. Or not a cartoon, but it was a uh, child show uh, in Hebrew there. I always kind of enjoyed that show. Belisa Dot. So Dot is secret. Uh, without a secret, literally is what Belisa Dot means. Without a secret. So they have a secret council against the people of God. And then he says, and they take a council. 
Al Sufanecha against the hidden ones. Who are the hidden ones? You see, the thing is, is Rome knows. They read, they read the Bible. They've also got all, they got all these big highfalutin preachers and stuff that have been joining in with them, like John Hagee. They need them as part of their team. Why? Because they're having secret meetings now, and they're asking them, we know that you guys have taught about two witnesses coming on the scene. What are we going to do about them? What are we going to do about these witnesses, these hidden ones? Mm. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Well, they're meeting with who? They're meeting with the Arab people as well. They meet with Mahmoud Abbas. When the Pope of Rome went to Israel, do you think he went to Benjamin Netanyahu first? No. You know, it wasn't that Netanyahu may not agree with him, but the thing is, is he showed his true color. He goes to the so-called Palestinians. And by the way, the Palestinians, it's not, this is, as, as Moshe Faglin brought out, he says, tell me, show me a, Palestinian coin? Can you show me where Israel had a war with Palestinians? No. The British were there. The Egyptians were there. These were Arabic peoples that they have brought in. They created a Palestinian people so that Rome could get their foot in the door because when they tried to create the state over there and bring in their certain people to, to rule the nation of Israel... And I know this for a fact. I've mentioned it many times before. It failed. It didn't work out just right. Why? Because there was a remnant of Israel that God had promised was going home. And they were getting in there and they were getting the upper hand. So they've tried to weaken the nation through politics. Mm. That's how he weakens the nations, by the way. Anyway, so he says on here, verse 6, for they have consulted together with one consent against thee. Do they make a covenant? Alecha berit ikaratu. What did we just read over there in Obadiah? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Hmm. When Esau is being searched out. In other words, they're willing to go with the Pope. They're willing to come down there and they're willing to try to break Israel. See, God said he'll bring all nations down there. He says, I'll enter into judgment with all of you. The men of thy confederacy. Who are the men of the confederacy? Well, let's see exactly according to Psalm 83. Psalm 83 reveals who the men of the confederacy are. Let's, let's back up again. Verse 3. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have come and said, let us... Cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance, for they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. All the men of thy confederacy. Now, this is in Obadiah, verse 7. But in Psalm 83, it says in verse 5, they are confederate against thee. Now, the Psalms reveals who's against them. He says, the tabernacles are the tents of Edom. Remember, I told you, Edom is Rome. We're going to prove it because it's all here in Obadiah. Edom is the Roman Catholic Church. The tents of Edom are all the churches that they control. Does it not say in Revelation that she is the mother of harlots? A harlot, a whore, is a woman that's untrue to her marriage vow. In this case here, God uses the modern woman in a marriage there as a type of the church. And men, by the way, you're women in this regards here because as part of the church, you're considered a woman, so you should have a little bit more kindness in the way you treat women because in the sight of God, you're a woman. And that regards there. So he says... The tabernacles are the tents of Adam and the, Ish and the Ishmaelites. Hmm... So in other words, not only Rome, but all these churches that have come back and all these church leaders that have joined back with Rome, including John Hagee, Joel Osteen. Now, the people like um, 
I've not seen people like, uh, as of yet, I've not seen Perry Stone or Chuck Nussler or any of these other leaders join up with the Vatican thus far, not like John Hagee has done and, and the list that I give you a little bit earlier. But nonetheless, though, they are preaching the Mahadi type of doctrine, which is dangerous because that's exactly what the Vatican wants you to teach. The Ishmaelites says who they are, of, Ho of Moab, and the Hagarines, and Gibal, and Ammon, and the Amalek, and the Philistines, with the inhabitants of Tiri, Asher, also joined with them. By the way, that's Assyria, that's joined with them as well. So he names all these people here, and according to Obadiah, it says here, all the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. And that's exactly right. They consulted secretly, according to Psalm 83, and then this confederacy of men have brought what? They brought Rome to the border of Israel. Along with all the Arab nations. Along with the United States. Along with the United Nations. Along with the European Union. They brought them all to the border. That's according to Obadiah. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee. Hmm. What men are at peace with her? The world leaders. Not only the world leaders, the religious leaders. Now, the religious leaders, I kind of wonder if they're just not duped into all this. But the world leaders have deceived Rome into thinking this is the right thing to do. And prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. Do you, if you think about this, what you begin to realize is everything that was done to Yeshua, to Jesus, is repeating right here. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. Look at all the people that were confederate with the Pharisees and Sadducees. And what did they do? They came down there. They even confederated, were confederate, church and state were confederate together to crucify Yeshua. And they deceived. They deceived Rome into believing that it was okay to kill Yeshua. And they prevailed. That was the Jews of that day, 2,000 years ago. Now, they did it for a reason, and God forgave them. But in this case here, there won't be any pardon. Because remember... Yeshua said one word against the Holy Spirit and never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. Do you realize that that also speaks of Judas when he was at the communion table with the Lord? This time here, now they have a new communion type of table. It is the Pope's communion table. And the ones that are eating with him are going to betray him just like Judas betrayed Christ. So you're going to get back what you gave to the Lord. Now, I say that because you got to remember, this battle really is between God and the devil. But people are influenced by those spirits in that spirit realm. There is none understanding in him. Somebody's going to deceive them. Just like Judas deceived Christ, or not deceived Christ, but went against him. So, so anyway, as we see, Psalm 83 clearly identifies this as, as the same thing. Um, you know, another thing that I thought was interesting too, I made myself a note about this. When it talks about the last part there, uh, thy bread, uh, uh, excuse me, they that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Oh, I'm sorry. Ba let me back up. It's before that part. That's what it was. That's right. I forgot all about that. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee, they have deceived thee. That's the same thing that Satan did to Eve. He deceived her. And she did eat. What is she from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? That's why Israel ended up with the law. 
that tree of life, the Eitz Chaim, that tree was Mashiach, it was Yeshua, and he's the olive tree. So if you've ever wondered what the trees were in the Garden of Eden, there you are. Hmm. All right, I get excited about that. Obadiah, verse 8. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? Sure, they took of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> so they're definitely going to have all their understanding destroyed. And they might, and thy mighty men of Timon shall be dismayed to the end that every one of Mount Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Now we're seeing history repeat itself. It repeats the, what happened in Rome. 2,000 years ago is what we see there. In Obadiah uh, verse 10, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Now see, now God is going to expose what was the violence against Jacob. It wasn't what happened when Esau and Jacob literally were together all those years ago. Now remember, Jacob wrestles with the angel, and he overcomes he walks with the limp the rest of his life, showing that Israel will be limping it around for 2,000 years. He walks with a limp as well. But when Esau comes down, he doesn't come down to kill him. He tells him, come on in. But you know, there was, you, couldn't, you could not buy Esau's friendship. Jacob tried, just like Israel's trying today, just like Netanyahu is trying with Rome, trying to appease the Pope, trying to, you can't appease that, you cannot appease Esau, Prime Minister. You cannot appease him with all your gifts, all your offerings, everything you do, cut the land up, whatever you want to offer the Pope, he will not accept it. And that's exactly what Jacob tried to do. He split and divided the people and sent them wave after wave to Esau. It says, will you accept this as a peace offering? Will you accept that as a peace offering? And then nothing worked. You think it's going to work? It won't. But God said he's going to cut them off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side. Now watch what he says. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. But you know, God took a long time to take vengeance. He has. Watch what he says here. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was as one of them. You know when they cast lots for Jerusalem? When they cast lots for the garments of Yeshua. Yeshua is Jerusalem. Verse 12, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither should thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Who's the brother? My rabbinical brethren, who is the brother? Do I, let, me, let, let me remind you. Let me remind you what is written in the Midrash so that you will know who the brother is. The Midrash declares, according to Genesis 30, 23, that Rachel was prophesying. When Rachel says, Yosef, Yayoi, Liben Achav, the Lord add to me another son. And you know, even according to the Midrash, that, that, that Yosh, uh, Yosef, Ben Yosef, or Yosef Hashem, May God add to me ben acher, from which it follows that Moshiach Melachama, one anointed for battle, will descend from Joseph, will be a descendant from Joseph. That's written in the Midrash. It's in the Midrash Yalamadun Denu, incited in the countries. And you know that. Why did you take it out of most of them? Because Yeshua looked too much like Yosef's son, didn't he? He looked too much like him. 
And here, when we're reading about Obadiah, and the thing is, as you quote from Obadiah, in order to bring out this in the Midrash, it's quoted from Obadiah. It actually is taken from Obadiah to know that what he's going to do. You, and you even go so far as to say that that would happen and, and, and that, uh, that he will be overcome and killed. Because Daniel speaks about that. That's why it's also written in the Talmud that before the destruction of the second temple that the Mashiach would come. We've had to backtrack on that one too, haven't we? But we sit here and we see it written right as plain as day in Obadiah. We see what Obadiah is saying now. Now, now it begins to make sense when he says, In that day thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou was one of them. He's talking about Esau when he says thou was one of them. But the loss that was cast on Jerusalem was speaking about the Messiah, the son of Ben Yosef. But thou shouldst not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. You see Esau? You see Rome? God is indicting you. Israel's paid for her sins for this. But he indicted you with her. You're going to find that out in a few minutes too. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. So don't think when he says thy brother, he's talking about the house of Judah. He's not. He's talking about Yeshua because he separates the two. Neither should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, Esau. Rome. Remember Titus the general? Remember what it says in Daniel chapter 9? What is it? Verse 26, 25, 26, 27. I forget which one. The prince that shall come would be of the people who would destroy the temple and, the, excuse me, destroy the city and the sanctuary. Titus was the Roman general. There is going to be a prince that shall come and he will be of the ones that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Excuse me, the sanctuary and the city there. A Roman. So the prince that shall come has to be a Roman. That's another clue for you. Neither should as thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Hmm. Thou shouldst not have entered into the gate of my people the day of their calamity. See how God separates through the prophet Obadiah, he separates my people, the house of Judah, and he separates thy brother. And the Midrash says that that son of Joseph, that future son of Joseph, who you call the Mashiach, that he would become a stranger. We made him a stranger. My fathers and your fathers made him a stranger. Verse 13, thou shouldst not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldst not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Who was it that took back the treasures of the temple to Rome? Titus. So Rome is indicted for laying hands on their substance, and Obadiah calls them Adam, Esau's descendants. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those uh, that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in that day, in the day of distress. Like at Masada, just one of many cases where you hunted down the Jews and killed all that you could. And I know there's expositors that speak about how that the ones that did all the killing and stuff was not actually the Romans. It was, it, was the, it was the Syrians that they had united with and battled part of the Babylonian kingdom. They were the soldiers. He said, you were as one with them. The mere consent brought the guilt. And Obadiah, verse 15 says, For the day of Yahweh." is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. 
For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. That was fulfilled in modern days, where you came back around. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, this is when Rome entered into Israel, and the Israeli government allowed them to take over Mount Zion and have a communion service, and they took their sacraments and drank their wine on God's holy mountain. And the Pope defiled Mount Zion. Verse 17, he says, Upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. For those that didn't know where it happens at, now he names you the mountain. And there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Now, is that an illusion? Possibly alluding to the possibility that they will bring back the temple treasures? Possibly so. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. House of Joseph of flame. See, he comes back with vengeance, doesn't he? Now we're looking at Isaiah 63. Hmm. There shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. They of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain of the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, the fields of Samaria. Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of his host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even at the Zareph. And the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in uh, Sephard, shall possess the cities of the south. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Yah-e-ha-eh. Yah-e-ha-eh. Saviors. Do you know what the word is in Hebrew there? I'm going to tell you in a minute. But before I tell you that, let me just show you one thing that I just, I read over it and didn't tell you about it. And the house of Joseph aflame. Now, recently, a precious sister had me relook at a scripture. And it's the reason why, you know, it's funny. It wasn't just the fact of look, re-looking at the, the scripture of, uh, of Isaiah 63. But you know, I couldn't understand why I just could not get a piece about making the video. Perhaps the Lord knew. In fact, not only from the, the sister sending me, asking me to go back and look at this particular book, or this, yeah, this book in Isaiah 63, the Lord took me into a research that I've been sharing with you that I would have never known had it not happened. So everything happens for a reason. Everything. I do believe that. Who is this that cometh from Edom with thy garments from Basra that is, that is glorious in his apparel, travailing in the greatness of his strength? I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth the wine, pre the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. You're seeing the Messiah. My Jewish brethren, Ben Yosef, the prophecy of Rachel. A woman gives a prophecy of the coming of Messiah. Even the Midrash, the sages wrote about it. Look at the life of Joseph and then look at the life of Yeshua. I've done many videos on it into a depth that only by the grace of God that you could see it even deeper. It wasn't the fact that he was just sold out. The very fact that he that they find their money in their bag when they get to the inn, Joseph's brothers, shows that we rejected him when he was in his mother's womb. The mere fact that Joseph puts his cup in Benjamin's bag is prophetic, showing two things. One, that even though we as Jews today were not 
part of his own death 2,000 years ago, yet the cup is in our bag. What will we do with it? It also shows that the Benjamites would be the ones that would call out for his blood, the innocent one. He would be rejected at the communion table. It speaks of that as well. Why do you see that here in Obadiah, it speaks about they drink upon his holy mountain. God is bringing everything back against Esau. This is why Jacob types and Jacob's son, Joseph. Mm. So when he comes from Edom, it's because the Messiah has destroyed Rome and he dipped his own garments in their blood. But it, it, does, it happens in a, in a peculiar order. We see it in scripture. Sometimes it takes months, years for things to fulfill. So let's go back. Let's look again. And... So Joseph, see, and the house of Joseph, a flame in the house of Esau for stubble. That's Isaiah 63. Joseph, or the son of Joseph, as the rabbis noticed, comes to destroy Rome. They thought it was supposed to happen 2,000 years ago. You know, the funny thing is, is we recognize, even in the writings of the sages, it was there was a son of Joseph, a prophecy there, and there was supposed to be the son of David. It was one in the self same as the Messiah in both cases. And we see two different fulfillments. My Jewish brethren, why didn't we see this? I, I know my, my precious Christian brothers and sisters, that may be a little a little foreign in what I'm saying to you, and I, I think you can follow along as well, though. But it's just things that are kind of touching my own heart as I think about my brethren and what they've gone through and the things that we should have saw but we didn't because why? God said we were blinded. But in the latter days, our eyes would be open. So he goes on to say that Esau became stubble and shall kindle in them, okay, now, when I got down to verse 21, it says, And Savior shall come up on, uh, on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, that it's also translated as delivers, and it's something I want to really bring out to you because it's speaking of the two witnesses. And you're really going to find this interesting because, again, it caused me to do a deeper research, and so I want to share some things with you here. It says here, and they will arise anointed ones on Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau. It actually, ve'alu mushuim b'chazion, okay? They, and they, excuse me, it literally says, and they, this is, I'm giving you, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not even thinking of what I'm telling you here. I'm giving you the literal translation. In Hebrew, I didn't read, I should have read it in Hebrew first for you. Ve'alu moshiim bechatzion lisha lisha pet etcha esav. And they will arise, anointed ones, on Mount Zion, to judge the mountain of Esau. Now, if you look at Zechariah 4.12, I want to take you to there for a second here. So we can see what these anointed ones are. Zechariah 4.12 says, And I answered again and said unto him, What what be these two olive branches which through the golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. All right? So it's interesting. We're seeing right here in... Um, Obadiah, where did I put it at? I've made so many notes on this one here. 
uh, in King James Version, it translated, and Savior shall come up on the Mount of Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. And literally, it says, to, and, and they will arise anointed ones. It's in the plural, like Moshiach, but Moshiim. See, Moshiim is anointed ones. Now, I want to take you a little bit deeper here and show you some things as well. Um, all right. When we're looking at Zechariah and we look at Zach, uh, the verse 14 where it says, Then said he, these are the two anointed ones. In Hebrew, it's not literally what it says. It's the way that we actually translate that, the word there. The, now, the root in this word is Zechariah. Now, Zechariah is it's got a lot of possibilities in how the meaning can be, but generally it's considered to be like um, a, a, a pure, clear oil. And one reason why, it, it, it's deeper than just that, it's oil that has not been refined. And I wanted to read to you just, it's very short, a commentary uh, that I picked up from uh, Abarim Publications, uh, and that can be found at www.abarim-publications.com. And this is a uh, Christian publication here that does uh, Hebraic studies here. They write in here about the word Sahar which is what they're using for the word anointed. The masculine noun, sahar, meaning noon or midday, the time of day when the sun is at its highest point in the sky. Uh, you can find that, by the way, in Genesis 43, 16 and 1 Kings 18, 29. That's where, that's where some of the verses that use that particular word, sahar, in Hebrew. The same word is used to express in the highest degree of merriment as well, which is also found in Psalms 37, 6 and Isaiah 58, 10. Now, keep this in mind, because they're not going to tell you this in this commentary here, but when I'm looking at the two anointed ones, you're going to see that everything that Zahar is in its homonym, because it is a homonym, but it's got like three different meanings there, it is perfectly in line with the anointed ones or the two witnesses that would actually be coming according to Revelation 11. All right, so keep that in mind. The one thing that I find is interesting is the part about the midday. It, meaning, it could mean midday or, or, or noon. So does that mean that the two witnesses come in the middle of the 70th week uh, or not? I don't know. Or is it between the 69th and the 70th week at the midpoint there? Is it that what that represents? Don't know. It's just, just an observation I wanted to share with you. But the other one, though, that is definitely an obvious is, is when it's used as a merriment. In other words, the, the, it's the total opposite of sadness. It's, it, it literally comes from the opposite uh, of gloom. And when you look at it in Isaiah 58.10, that is perfectly in line with Isaiah 61, which beautiful scripture because that's the one the Lord spoke to me years ago and told me to read. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Now that's where it begins. That's the, the acceptable year Yeshua put down the scroll and said this day this scripture is fulfilled. But then it goes on to say the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn to appoint them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So you see, he flips it around through what? Through the anointed ones that he sends. So it's, it's very interesting there. But getting down to the part where it deals with why they use the word anointed ones here, they write here, at the end of, of, of his mystery vision of the golden lampstand, Zechariah sees two olive trees at either side of the lampstand and is told that these verses are two sons of literally fresh oil. That's the way it's translated there. The word is sons of fresh oil who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. It's probably more likely that in this case, our word is re, uh, regular third person tense of the root verb, Zahav, and that these two are not the two sons of fresh oil, but rather the two sons of he who is being most high, or the sons of the anointed one, which is the Messiah, which is exactly what they'd have to be the sons of because the oil that that, that, that life-given branch, which Christ is the branch, he's the root of the olive tree, flows through them. So I just thought that was interesting. So now look at Revelation 11 in regards to this. I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of, of the earth. All right, now I got to keep a hold of 
Obadiah here because you've got to see something here. Remember, and deliverers shall come up or anointed ones shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. They judge it. They bring judgment upon it. But God does the destroying. Christ comes and does the destruction. The two witnesses bring judgment. And how is, And it's the same with Moses. When Moses came out of Egypt, Moses and Aaron, what did they do? They brought judgment on the house of Pharaoh. Plagues and everything like that. But it was God himself that took part of the Red Sea and destroyed the Egyptian army. Think about that one for a while. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now notice he calls them the two olive trees. There's that fresh sons of the fresh oil. See? And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. All right? Now, Revelation eleven six. 6. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. You're going to see like the ministry of Moses and Aaron repeating all over again, except this time it's Moses and Elijah doing this. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beasts ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street in the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people of the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. How do the people of the world see this in the first place? Remember, they were doing a confederacy in Psalm 83. They consulted against thy hidden ones. God's hidden ones. So they were planning on what to do with these guys, and their idea was to murder them. They make a covenant against God. In other words, they're willing to kill them, even against God's writing of his word. So people you like John Hagee and, and guys like yourself that have joined with the Vatican, you're willing to murder the two witnesses. Why? Because they won't agree with your theology? Believe me, they won't. You know, when the Bible says two men of the nations will take all the skirt of a Jew and say, we've heard the Lord is with you. You ever think that maybe they're taking hold of the skirt of Elijah or the skirt of Moses? They're taking the hold of the skirt of a Jew. Interesting, isn't it? Their dead bodies shall lie in the street the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because of these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth, what they brought judgment. And I, there's, I do plenty of videos on the identity, proven who the two witnesses are. You can find those on YouTube easy enough. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life of God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Remember, now Christ goes after the death of these two witnesses. This is when saw, or excuse me, Isaiah 63 will be fulfilled. That's when he can go trample uh, Rome and destroy Rome and their blood will be upon his garment. Why? Because in order to judge a whore according to, Rev, uh, according to the Levitical law, you have to have two witnesses. And God sends two witnesses to declare who Christ really was, that he indeed was the Messiah. And this is what he actually preached, because they'll be preaching what he preached. And they kill them, and the resurrection of their bodies open before the public is what gives the world the witness that indeed they, what they testified was true because God rises them up before the world, and now the world is going to be judged as a result of that. Not just the whore of Rome, not just Esau, the rest of the world will follow suit with that as well. So now the question is: Is when does Rome? When is this? When are they? When are they going to? When is God going to judge them? If you go to Ezekiel thirty-five, let's go to verse thirteen. Thus, with your mouth, you have boasted against me. Again, another passage against Adam. In this case, he calls him Mount Seir. Mount Seir is where Adam is from. This is where Esau lived. Was in Mount Seir. Uh, you have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Thus saith the Lord God, and by the way, if you go back up in, in Ezekiel a little bit further, go up to like verse 9, this is where you find out that they speak of the two-state solution. And what their intent was, was to take, as they say, both nations, or as the Lord dwelt there. 
Interesting, isn't it? Anyway, so God gives a judgment here. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. As thou didst rejoice in the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all Edomia, even all of it, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. So they're going to do it when the earth rejoices. And according to Revelation 10, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them that make merry. At what? At the death of the two witnesses. That's what brings the second coming of Mashiach. Believe it or not, I still have note after note after note. Malachi Chapter 1, verse 4, Whereas Adam saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places, saith the Lord of hosts. They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord had indignation forever. Again, Rome, Mount Adam, or Adam, excuse me, Esau's descendants. And yes, it's going to be Rome that's going to help them to build their uh, third temple, so to speak. Uh, also, if you want to look, though, to see, as I mentioned to you earlier, about Hadad and his descendants, that's in 1 Kings chapter 11, starting at verse 16. You can read all about that. Uh, one other thing I'd like to end with here, I, I've still got a little bit more notes, but I'd like to just share with you one last thing in closing. And that is in Psalm 60. God says in verse 7, Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. Then he says, Moab is my wash pot. Over Adam will I cast out my shoe. Philistia, triumph thou because of me. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Adam? Wilt not thou, O God, which has cast us off, and thou, O God, which didst not go out with our enemy armies? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. He said, I tread the winepress alone. Is that right? That's Psalm 60. Now, when it talks about he cast over, cast out his uh, shoe over Adam, that's Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. In order to get Naomi or Ruth, he had to redeem Naomi. And what was the custom? He had to take off his shoe to show that he had redeemed her. And that's exactly, exactly what happens. And one last one I want to read to you as well. Lamentations 421. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Adam, that dwellest in the land of Oz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt thou and shall make thyself naked. Daughter of Adam? The Bible says in Revelation, what, what, what about her? Revelation 3, excuse me, not Revelation 3, um, where it talks about that she is the mother of harlots. That's those churches that have joined back up with Rome. And you'll see them keep doing it too. There's going to be more to joins with her. Those are the harlots. Those are the daughters. He said, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Adam, thou that dwellest in the land of us. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. What cup? The cup that Israel had. Notice what he says, verse 20. The breath of the nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we will live among the heathen. He's prophesying that what? That Israel will have to go live. They'll be dispersed and go live among the heathen. And then it says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Adam. Thou that dwellest in the land of us, the cup also shall pass through unto thee. In other words, you're going to get your chance also to see whether or not you will reject Christ or if you will accept him. And you will find also among the Gentiles, it's just a little remnant that really believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. But what did he say about him? Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. Remember what God said about the Laodiceans. These things saith the Lord, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He said, amen, sorry. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that you were work cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of, out of my mouth. 
because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods. That's what the Vatican says. She's rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest thou not, thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So when the daughters of Adam get the cup, end up making themselves naked, thinking that they're putting on clothes. It goes right back to, to the Garden of Eden again, doesn't it? Because why? You're eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and not clothing yourself in the righteousness of the Messiah Christ. If you would be clothed in righteousness, you would be eating of the tree of life and you'd be clothed in the light of God, the light of men, as John writes about in his epistle. Verse 22, the punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. So at the time that the daughter of Adam actually becomes naked is when the iniquity is accomplished of the daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Adam. He will discover thy sins. So see, the cup got passed from the Jews to the Gentiles. And we see what happens there. And my precious brothers, sisters that are Gentile believers, those of you that have stayed true to Christ, God bless you. You're a remnant, just like Israel's a remnant. You are part of Israel. The Edomites had to have daughters, and they did according to Revelation. They did. Oh, my gosh. By the way, the daughter is this, Revelation 17, 5. And upon her forehead was name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. We love you guys tremendously. God bless you. Pray for us here. Um, I have several prayer requests. One, we will be um, making a tour in the United States uh, in the month of March, late March, early April. And uh, we've been invited to go to Sister Leora up in Chicago, Illinois, to speak at a conference there. And we're looking at organizing one in Atlanta for our brothers and sisters that are near that area there. Uh, don't know exactly what else we'll do there. We'll only be there for about three weeks, uh, and then we'll have to come back uh, overseas here. Uh, we're going through a lot of places uh, throughout Europe as well, besides Israel. We'll be in Israel quite a bit as it is, uh, but we'll also, by God's grace, be going into, um, let me just say, very key places in, in Europe as well as uh, going to Russia um, to try to cover things for you, to take you into the inside workings to show you firsthand, just as we do in Israel, show you firsthand things that happen. And uh, so I want, I'm asking you to pray for us. And, and it's your support and your help that helps us to do these things. Also, I have some medical procedures that I will have to be undergoing. Uh, I'm actually in Prague right now because this is where our, my medical is done for me, is here in Prague. And I'll be going back to Israel after the medical treatment here. Um, but we need your uh prayers on that as, and, and, and your support. We appreciate and thank you for that because without you, it's not possible what we do. And, uh, and here it's cheaper for me to do medical treatment because I don't have insurance, neither in America nor here. But just pray for us. We love you and thank you and God bless you. And I trust this message has been a blessing to you. Sorry for the link. God bless. Good night.